If you're visiting, uh, either upstairs or downstairs today, we'd like to thank you for coming. Uh, in the way of announcements, we, uh, we're broadcasting live upstairs today. We're downstairs. If you don't feel comfortable wearing masks, uh, you're not uh, required to do so downstairs. We've got a TV set up outside for those who uh, continue to choose to want to be outside. Uh, we're live on Facebook. We're live on radio uh, 93.5 this morning. And we'll be broadcasting on YouTube later on if you want to rewatch the uh, service. In the way of prayer requests, we're still uh, planning on having uh, Brother Kyle Butts here on November 6th through 8th. So we'll continue to pray for that. Uh, and we'll continue to do the service we're planning to as we are right now. Upstairs with masks, downstairs without, uh, outside. Uh, so we'll follow the same format. Uh, Gary, we'll keep him in our prayers. He's still having the, uh, he's quarantined due to his lung transplant trial at Duke, so keep uh, remembering him in the prayers. And uh, this Thursday, at uh, Thursday the 8th at 10.30, Brian's going to start his class back, uh, his Bible study downstairs. So if you're, uh, if you're wel uh, welcome to join if you're able to. Uh, one other is... Uh, Next Saturday at 5 p.m. at uh, Cy and uh, Becky's house, she's going to have, or well, they're going to uh, promote a chili cook-off. So if you're able to come, uh, just get up with uh, Becky on details on that one. That'll be next Saturday at 5 p.m. And with that, if you will go with me to uh, God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for all the blessings. We're thankful to be able to come back into the building and worship you. And we're thankful for all you've given us today. Lord, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for meeting our needs. Lord, we pray for those on the prayer request, and we'll pray for the upcoming gospel meeting. Lord, as we continue to service, we pray we do this in a manner that's pleasing to you. And be with Brother Brian as he delivers a message that will, will resonate with us and we can go out and share with others. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Today's Bible reading will come out of Joshua. Joshua chapter... I've got the wrong one. Sorry, Brian. Joshua chapter 24. There is no chapter between. Well, okay, I trust my memory more than my writing. Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves the day whom you will serve. I'm sorry. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In preparation of the Lord's Supper, I ask that you turn to... All right, excuse me, I'm going to go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And a lot of folks like to start earlier in that, in that chapter, but I'm going to start in verses 27 and 29, 27 through 29. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. I've read this verse of scripture or these verses of scripture many times in the past. And I've always understood it to mean basically that we're supposed to evaluate ourselves and think about ourselves and, and not just think about, yes, think about Jesus and what he sacrificed for us, but also to look at ourselves and ask ourselves if we're behaving or living in a manner that honors that sacrifice. But today as I was preparing, I also was looking at the acts, the, uh, the original and the Gospels where they were talking about the institution of the Lord's Supper. And I noticed something that I had, had not really, I mean, I'd read it, but I'd not really connected that with what Paul was saying to the, first Corinth, to the Corinthians. 
It says, uh, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 22, verse 20. And this is during the, the uh, while he was eating with uh, the apostles. He said, likewise, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Maybe Paul wasn't thinking at the time about Judas at the time when he wrote to the Corinthians. But at the time when Jesus was talking and he was um, instituting the Lord's Supper, do you really think Judas's mind was where it should be? And, and I'm going to say something that's going to sound a little harsh, but if our minds are not on what we're doing when we're partaking the Lord's Supper, we are betraying what Jesus established for us and what he sacrificed for us. So with that, I want to encourage for everyone to take the worldly mind and set it aside and focus right now on your hearts and on your soul and think about what Jesus sacrificed for us so that we could be here and worship him and have the opportunity for salvation. Please pray with me as I uh, ask for blessings on the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, you sacrificed so much for us by sending your son down here to die for us. And we did not earn it and we did not deserve it, Father, but we gracefully and graciously accept that offering, Father. Father, help us to turn our minds towards you and towards the sacrifice and towards the suffering that Jesus did on our behalf. And please bless, bless this bread as we partake of it. Praise in your son's holy name. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blood that was shed for us, the blood that actually cleanses our bodies and cleanses our souls of the sins that we have committed, Father, and allows us the opportunity not only to go to heaven, but to address you directly, Father, and to ask for your blessings and for your help. We pray this in your Son's holy name. Amen. And we are directed once once a week to set aside from our uh, from from the war, from what the Lord has blessed us with, and uh, at this time I'd like to say a, a prayer of thanks and also a prayer of blessings on what we do with that with those funds. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us financially and and also physically, Father. And uh, we have so much more than what we deserve and so much more than what we can do with. And as we return some of these blessings back to you, Father, we ask that you bless it to the furtherance of your kingdom and you be with those who manage these funds and, and help them to do so in a way that is pleasing to you, Father. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. Good morning. Good to see you. It's so good to be back together uh, for this time of worship. I want to begin by saying thank you to, um, to Steve and Neil who helped lead us today and those who are helping to uh, make this possible. Uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties that we may be experiencing, uh, but uh, we're working on it and hopefully soon we'll, we'll get all this lined out. Uh, so hopefully uh, sound is coming across well. Uh, you know, you think about why we're here this morning, and I appreciate so much what, what Steve was just relating to us about the Lord's Supper and about how important it is that, that God doesn't just ask for us to do things in the correct way, and he does. 
But he also asks for something more, and, and, and that's for our minds and our hearts. For us to come to, to this time of worship with a, with a mind and heart that's ready to worship, ready to focus on God and on His Son and, and on why we're here this morning. And so as we're all working on that, on becoming better worshipers, and, and trying to rid ourselves of the world, I want to spend some time this morning focusing on, on our God, on our, on our Redeemer, on our Creator and our Judge. I got a question this, uh, a couple weeks ago on, on a question about God, and we've, we've from time to time done a series of lessons on on difficult or, or hard biblical questions. And so I've been trying to deal with those as they come across uh, my desk or come to my attention. And someone passed along the note that their grandchild was asking them, who made God or where did God come from? What a big question. What a big question for any of us to ask about the origins of the God we serve. We know that everything that lives and exists around us, all were created by something. Uh, they're, they're not here by accident, not here by half and chance. You're not here by accident. But there was a plan, there was forethought, there was power involved in your creation. There was a creator, a cause. The first great cause. So the next obvious question comes to mind is where did that cause come from? We know him as God. We know him as Lord and Master. And again as Redeemer and Savior. Where did God come from? I, I hope to deal somewhat with that question. I will admit at the onset that that is a big question. And I don't know all the ins and outs of how to answer that question exactly because I wasn't there and I haven't been told all the things about uh, God that I would love to know. But in Joshua 24 is where I'd like to begin our study this morning. Joshua 24 is a pivotal chapter to the Israelites. They are preparing themselves to cross over into the promised land. Or, I'm sorry, in Joshua 24, they've taken the promised land. It's near the end of the life of Joshua. And they're preparing to live life without Joshua. And... He asked them a couple questions, and they're very important in regard to the history of Israel. And if they had just listened a little more closely, held his advice a little bit more firmly, then maybe they wouldn't have had the problems they had. But Joshua says in verse 14 of Joshua 24, Now therefore fear the Lord. And serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your, sight, in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of... Uh, of your fathers, or whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Unfortunately, as the Israelites came out of Egypt, and even after a generation had passed in the wandering, Israel's battle with idolatry did not end. You think about what idolatry says to our God. Isn't it the same as committing adultery against a spouse? We have declared before God that we do not need him. 
that we are searching for something else, something in our minds that seems better. And so Israel battled with idolatry throughout their history until the Babylonian captivity because they could not hold on to God, because they refused to accept God and to accept his blessings and his covenant with them. You think about our relationship with God. It really comes down to a question that Elijah asked in 1 Kings 18, 21. In the midst of this battle with idolatry, Elijah asked the question of all the people, how long will you linger or limp? He says, uh, the English Standard Translation translates this, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. It's really the question for us. If God is God, if the Lord is God, and we make that declaration and we choose Him, then He has promised to bless us. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6, in a discussion of faith, the Hebrews writer says it plainly to us. We often preach and teach about faith and we speak about the importance of faith and this is really what all this is about. The Hebrews writer plainly says to us, without faith it is impossible to please him, to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must, without a doubt, believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who seek him. It's about making a choice. Faith begins at the pronouncement of knowledge. But it commences at making a choice to serve God over everything else. Think about God. And think about what he means to us, to our world. Just how big is God? This morning, for the time we have remaining, I just want to spend a little bit of time looking at the character of God. Of what we can know from his written word. What he has revealed to us in his holy word. You think about the characteristics of God, I would say number one, and, and hopefully an answer to the question, where did God come from? I want to go to Job 36 and verse number 26. Notice the answer given in the book of Job. 36 and verse 26, Job... Uh, the writer writes, Behold, God is great, and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. What an interesting note to make about God. Can we put a number on the years of God? Can we put a beginning to God. You notice the psalmist writes in Psalm 41 in verse number 13 about our great God. He says, Psalm 41, 13, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. The reality is God is not numbered in years. He is above and beyond time. It's so hard for us to understand that concept. 
Because we are so tied to the idea of time. Each and every one of us has a distinct beginning. We celebrate it every year. And the more that come, the more we begin to dread it. I don't know when that heal happens. There's a certain point in our lives when we start going down the other side and we say, stop. But the reality is God doesn't have a birthday because God does not have a beginning. God is in his essence eternal. Where did God come from? It's a difficult question to answer because the answer is so hard for us to understand. But the reality is he didn't come from anywhere. He has always existed. There was nothing that created God. There's nothing that caused God to be. He simply is. In the book of Exodus, when Moses is there at the burning bush and he asked God, as God has told him to go to Egypt, he says, whom shall I say that is sending me? God simply said, tell them that I am has sent you. I am. He just simply is and has always been and will always be. God exists above and beyond our limitations of time. In Psalm chapter 90, in verses 1 and 2, the psalmist writes of God, he says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is eternal. Number two, in John chapter 4, verse 24, as Jesus speaks to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, and they get in a discussion about worship. Jesus makes this proclamation about God. In a discussion of those who would worship God, that they must worship in spirit and truth. For God, verse 24, is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. God is not a corporeal being. In other words, God does not have flesh and bone. God is not formed by the substances of this world. God is spirit. You may ask, well, what does that mean? I've never seen a spirit. We, can't, we cannot scientifically identify what the spirit world is. What is a spirit? To help hopefully explain this. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse number 26. After a discussion of the creation of all other things, God then turns to his apex creation. And yes, that is you. The text reads here, Then God said... Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Later in verse number 27, he again says, So God created man in, the, in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Why are you different than every other living creature? I recently had a discussion with this with the boys and we were talking about the difference between themselves and the animals they love. You are different than the animals. You are different than every other created thing in that you were formed in the likeness or the image of God. It's interesting there in the text, that word image, it's the Hebrew word teslam. And it refers to 
something that is a shadow of something else, something that is formed in the likeness of something else. In verse 26, God defines through Moses what that likeness is when he says, in the likeness of God. You and I are formed to be like God. Now, we've already said God does not have a corporeal form. He doesn't exist in a human or a human-like body. He's not talking about our physical substance. He's talking about our mind, our spirit, our soul. When we think about God and we think about what God is, God is a mind. He is the great mind. The all-encompassing, all-powerful, all-benevolent mind. What separates you from animals? It is your ability to think. To reason. To understand what morality is. What is moral and what is immoral. God is the great mind. In Genesis 9 and verse number 6, in a discussion of the evilness of murder, God makes this statement to Noah. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Now notice the end of this. For God made man in his own image. You are special. Don't let anyone tell you differently. You are not like the other created things. And that's because God put in you a mind, a spirit, likened unto his own. You have been formed in the image of God. You realize this, though? If you're a Christian, if you've been born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, by being immersed into him, you realize you've been made into the likeness of God twice? You realize that? Go to Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to begin at verse number 20 as Paul discusses the new man. The new man formed in the image of God. Verse number 20, that is not the way you learned Christ. Talking about the old man, the sinful man. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him. Have you heard about Jesus? If you haven't, we would love to talk to you about this man, about this God who came in the clothing of a man. As the truth is in Jesus, verse 22, but uh, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt to the deceitful desires, verse 23, notice this, and to be renewed in where? In the spirit of your minds. To put on the new self created after what? The likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. If you are a child of God, you are blessed beyond measure because you've been given the opportunity yet again to be formed in the likeness of God. In Galatians 3 and verse 27, Paul says in a discussion about becoming a child of God, he says when we are baptized, we are clothed in Christ. We are formed in the likeness of our Lord and Savior. What an amazing thought. 
Number three, what else do we know about God? Go to Deuteronomy 32 and verse number four. As Moses writes about the rock. Deuteronomy 32 and verse number four. Moses writes, the rock, his work is perfect. <clears throat> For all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity. Just and upright is he. You cannot talk about God without talking about his holiness, his justness, his uprightness. God is just. God is unchanging in his faithfulness to his promises. In James chapter 1 and verse number 13, James says of God that he cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt any man. God is perfect. The same is said of Jesus in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, where the Hebrews writer says, we do not have a high priest who cannot, what? Sympathize or understand our weaknesses, but in every respect tempted as we, yet without sin. Our world is filled with sin and sinful people. This building inside and out is filled with individuals who were sinful people. People who have been redeemed, bought back, but nonetheless, weak at times. We all are. God is not like that. God is perfect in all his ways. And so Peter says to us in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14, that we are to be holy as he is holy. He says in verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Our God is a holy, perfect God. You may say to me, and ask the question rightly, you've already said we're sinful creatures. How in the world can we be holy as he is holy? Mm, here's the beauty of Christ, of the gospel, of what he offers to us. If you are a child of God, bought back by the blood of Jesus, you have a special gift from God. Notice 1 John 1 and verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and notice this, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If you're a Christian today, you've been given a precious gift. If you are walking in faith, Struggling, fighting your fight of faith, remaining in the line. We have a promise that the blood of Jesus can make us holy, like God is holy. Not because we're better than anyone else, but because simply we've chosen to obey. Have your sins been washed away? Have you been cleansed? There's a wonderful opportunity given to you through the gospel, to have your sins washed away. And that brings me to the last thing I'll say here about the characteristics of God. This is not an exhaustive list by any means. We could talk about the nature of God for the rest of our lives and still yet not fully comprehend who God is. 
But if you go to 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, John has a lot to say about this particular characteristic of God. 1 John 4, beginning at verse number 7, John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. So many books, so many lectures, so many people have tried to tell us about what it means to love, what love is. We've written thousands of songs about it, written how many poems and books about it. And yet it's been here the whole time. Love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because, notice this, God is love. You cannot define what love is without bringing God into the discussion. He is the beginning and the end of what it means to love. Verse number nine, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. You think about loving someone. Husbands, wives, moms and dads, sons and daughters, friends. Understand you want to know what it means to love your spouse, your children, your friends, you better go and look at the story of our God. The story of his love with us. Love hurts sometimes. Love means giving all of ourselves. Love means putting ourselves to the side. In this, the love of God was manifest among us. Why? That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Don't you think God was pained during that time? Don't you think God hurt during that time and yet God never called his son back? Love. The love of God means everything to those who are children of God. Because we understand the cost of God's love. The great demonstration of that love. Again, in 1 John 4, John defines God is love, verse number 16. And I want you to notice the end of this here. Verse number 18, or verse number 17. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence, may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love because we love because he first loved us. As a child of God, I do not have to fear death. I do not have to fear judgment. I do not have to fear eternity. God put his spirit in you, or a like spirit in you, which means on that day you become an immortal being. Do you realize that? Yes, your physical body will die one day. It will be cast aside, yet your spirit will live on forever. The choice becomes, and this is where the fear comes, whether you will live with God in paradise, in heaven, or you will live eternity in hell. If you are not right with God, if you are not in a right relationship with God, you should be afraid. You should be fearful. That kind of fear will drive you to do what you should do. But if you are a child of God, you do not have to fear that. I'm not perfect. I'm not holy on my own. I am a sinful creature. But in Christ, 
He cast all of that away. And I can live with the surety of knowing one day he will come to carry me home. There is no fear in love. If you're afraid of dying, if you're afraid of the judgment, then we must ask the question, why are you afraid? What are you fearful of? I know today that fear can be cast away. 1 Kings 18 and verse 21, how long will you go limping along? Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are limping through life because they have refused God's offer of salvation. How long will you continue in that state, limping between two different opinions? Will you choose to obey God today? God loves you more than I could ever express. You want to know about the love of God, open your Bibles up and begin reading about all he's done for you. Don't allow another day to go by without you reaching out. Reaching out in faith to God to obey the gospel. We can help you in any way. We would love to do that this morning. If you're a child of God who, because of the sin in your life, you've got reason to fear. Cast that fear aside by doing what God wants you to do, by repenting. Necessary asking for forgiveness. We'd love to help you. If in any way we can do that, please come as together we stand and as we sing.